We're sitting down today with Rune Christensen. He's the founder of MakerDAO. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rune. Thanks so much for having me here. So yesterday, MakerDAO tweeted that uh, the Maker Foundation uh, uh, made a maker sell of $27.5 million to Dragonfly Capital Partners and Paradigm. Um, the idea is to kind of bring DeFi, and particularly stable coins, to Asia, particularly China and South Korea. I'm curious, uh, why Asia and why now? So the mission of the Mega Project and the Mega Foundation is to create an unbiased currency for the world, which, of course, means for everyone all across the world. And Asia is a very, you know, generally it's a big part of the world where a large portion of all the people in the whole world, they live in Asia. But if you look specifically at crypto and the crypto industry, how it's evolving right now, it is actually really centered around Asia as the hub when it comes to infrastructure and interest um, of regular people into crypto. So for us, it's incredibly important that we have a strong presence and some really well-connected and knowledgeable partners. You know, and I've uh, done some reading and uh, the idea is that there's a lot of interest in, uh, particularly in China, in stable coins and DeFi applications. Tether has had quite a lot of success there. Of course, uh, you're a bit different than Tether. While they have uh, collateral in a bank account, um, you're a algorithm-based stable coin. Could you kind of discuss the, the interest that you're seeing in Asia in stable coins? Yeah, like you said, Tether is really, it's really a very unique success story when it comes to how much it is used in China in particular, but also many other Asian countries. Uh, and, and it, like, traditionally what Tether is really used for is, is facilitating crypto liquidity and crypto speculation. But we're actually even now starting to see things like import-export businesses using it. And, and you know, really seeing this... Um, grassroots adoption of crypto that's happening generally across Asia to start turning into actual value created for businesses and individuals who use it for more than just speculation. And so um, what Maker brings to the table and uh, the broader movement of decentralized finance where we, you know, we move beyond just having a centralized stable coin like Tether, but actually um, provide some of the advantages that, that Bitcoin also has, right? Where um, combine the stability um, of the traditional financial system, but then with the self-sovereignty and the security and the transparency of the blockchain world. Um, and I think that initially we don't really, you know, we wouldn't expect uh, something like the DAI stablecoin that we are trying to, to, to get adoption across Asia. We wouldn't expect that to directly compete with or like replace Tether in, in the role that Tether currently has as, as this the backbone of liquidity in, in Asian crypto, but rather complement it because while Tether is great, um, there's no way to, to um, easily get a return on your Tether, for instance. And, and, and that is where the DAI stablecoin and the Mega Protocol really provides something very unique because um, it's already very popular for people around the world to, to purchase DAI and then lend it out to people, to other people around the world through these decentralized finance or DeFi dApps um, that have become very developed recently and now are also starting to gain attention in Asia. So we think this is really the right time to, to start um, focusing even more on this region and then really try to accelerate the, the growth and interest that's already happening. Can you take us through the decision-making process from beginning to end uh, regarding moving into China and Asia, like what were some of the key indicators that you were looking at and what was sort of the, at the foundation, um, the discussion revolving around regarding Asia? So what's really interesting is actually that, it, first of all, it is essentially common knowledge in the crypto markets that China really is the most important market, right? It really is um, the, the country that, other than the U.S., essentially, that really is like, like running the, the entire crypto space when it comes to things like uh, trading volume and, and just like, um, you know, really adopting 
and and you and actually using in real life the new technologies that are possible with blockchain um so and this was known even before you know this was even in the early days of bitcoin bitcoin only got really big once it started getting traction in china and it was kind of like once it started getting traction in china suddenly it it really started getting traction you know it's like the it's very sudden and and massive um escalation of interest that's how crypto technology is adopted in asia versus the more organic growth that that happens in the in the west typically um and so when we first um designed and we started the project uh the mega project which is almost 5 years ago now we actually um, believed that china was going to be like it was the most important market and it was what we wanted to focus on initially and you can even see that in in the for instance in the the name of the dai stablecoin which is the the, the stablecoin product of the mega protocol right dai is actually named after a chinese word which means to write capital for a loan uh, because of how dai is backed by these this this uh, capitalized uh, decentralized credit system um however what we then found out after actually spending a lot of energy on on trying to to um, you know launch and initially start the project out based on the chinese market was that um chinese and asian crypto users and and traders they actually don't want to be the very first so they want to like once they once they're interested in something they get really interested and they really move in and they really like uh, get behind the technology but but um they typically want to see that validation happen from from the western markets first so ultimately we we had to conclude that it was too early to focus on china and instead we focused on growing organically um you know in the in the western crypto sphere but also in in south america for instance and and just find other markets that where it made more sense to try to start out and basically since then we've kept asking ourselves the question so when is the time we should really go all in on asia again and basically when dragonfly came to us we we actually um we spoke to them for quite a while and then recently now that basically because now a lot of of different factors are coming together including that we just launched the multi collateral die which is the most important upgrade we've done to the system yet so with all of these things coming together we decided that now is the time that we believe that the um, the asian market is ready for for maker and the dai stablecoin and decentralized finance what some what are some challenges that the maker team is expecting in regards to this move into china in particularly but also asia generally i think the biggest challenge that always exists with china in particular is that the regulatory environment just constantly changes and and essentially flip flops because of how um yeah how it's a very opaque political system right so uh, as an example a couple of months ago there was this big proclamation that that the blockchain is a new thing and china wants to lead it and then a few months later there's there's a crackdown and there's like crypto exchanges having to delist coins and and um, a lot of exchanges shutting down and this kind of stuff and uh, this is actually always this has been the history of of china and bitcoin from the very beginning that there's this joke that every 3 months china bans bitcoin uh in the space and and it is basically because the 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 regulatory environment is currently in, is it's constantly in flux and that's exactly why that it's so important for us that we could partner up with with dragonfly which is a um a crypto fund that exactly has those um connections and has that inside a knowledge to understand how to navigate this kind of environment um because it can be very difficult if you're just coming from the outside um you know and don't really understand what it means when the when the things are when you know the regulatory landscape is currently it's constantly changing uh so i think we are very well equipped to navigate this but ultimately it is just a part of of um of accessing the incredibly huge market that china is could you tell us a little bit about your your partners at dragonfly and paradigm uh, i'm reading that they will have approximately like 5.5% of the uh, maker supply so could you speak to like 
the decision-making process behind finding these partners? Yeah, so we are actually, in the foundation, we are always getting contacted by various types of, of funds that are interested in, in buying the limited supply of MKR tokens. And typically, we are not really looking to sell to just anyone. Um, I think what's very important for us is to find partners that actually believe in the project long term and actually want to contribute to the vision of a decentralized financial system rather than just buying some tokens to speculate on their value or something like that. Um, and we also are very careful. So we spend a lot of time vetting our partners and really like getting to know them. Um, and uh, basically after having been in, in, in talks with uh, Paradigm and Dragonfly for a very long time, we really decided that, that um, these were exactly the, you know, the, they really were the real deal and they really had what it took, what it would take for us to, you know, make this kind of, of successful push into Asia where we'd be able to navigate all the challenges. In regards to your move into Asia, what's next now? Right. So actually we've, of course, um, had a presence in Asia in the past already. Right. So it's not like we have, we haven't been doing anything in Asia and, um, Another interesting piece of context is that China is actually already the country that provides the most traffic to some of the, some of the, um, the, uh, the user interfaces into the maker protocol. Um, and we, for, for about a year now, we've already had people on the ground in China, South Korea, Japan, and Singapore, which we see as some of the most important centers for the crypto industry in Asia. And, Basically, the next step is then just build on top of what we've already got and then really start to create the exponential growth, right? So uh, we want to have a better connection into the industry, more partners and more integrations. And I think we've, um, we've already really proven that the appetite is there to integrate our technology and, uh, and, and uh, use DeFi to, and bring it to a broader market with um, the very, the, this recent very big, de uh, very big um, integration and partnership deal we've done with the OKX exchange, which is it's one of the biggest exchanges in China and in Asia, but really also the world um, because of how, you know, because whatever is the biggest in Asia really typically is the biggest in the world. And uh, we think they're, they're just very professional, very focused on innovation. Um, and it's amazing that they actually stepped up and decided to be the trailblazer for integrating the die savings rate, uh, which is one of the critical new features that have been that has come to the die stablecoin. I'm aware of Western projects building on top of of Maker. Are you aware of any projects in Asia that are building on top of your platform or protocol? Yeah, I mean, so definitely the most important one to to call out right now is OKX and how they've integrated the die savings rate. To you know, to provide their users with um, a, a low risk return on their crypto, but there's also um, another uh, long time integration partner that we've had in in China is the wallet called I'm Token, which is the most popular Ethereum wallet in uh, in China, um, and they've actually drove a, you know they've been driving a lot of users to the MakerDAO protocol over the past year. Um, and there are also a lot of other projects in the works. So there's a lot of, there recently is this renewed wave of excitement around Ethereum and around uh, DeFi, basically because of the emergence of, of so many pro projects building on top of, of Maker and building DeFi, um, you know, startups and projects in the West. So um, I expect there will be a lot more coming out with announcements and, and product launches over the next couple of months. The the um, die the savings rate correct. Let's see here. So the die savings rate. What I find uh, fascinating about it is that it is uh, it fluctuates based on supply and demand. Could you kind of discuss the importance of supply and demand in the MakerDAO system? Yeah. So MakerDAO is very unique in that it keeps the die stablecoin stable and pegged to one U.S. dollar, not by holding U.S. dollar reserves in a bank account 
but rather by holding um, collateral assets such as the Ethereum cryptocurrency and in the future potentially tokenized real world assets. And then uh, using a decentralized and publicly controlled governance system to uh, manipulate the interest rates, essentially the, like the, the, um, the cost of generating DAI and also the, the return you get on holding DAI savings in the system. Um, and by doing this, what you can do is you can change the incentives towards um, supply and demand and, and directly impact the supply and demand. For instance, if the price of DAI is below $1, then what needs to happen is you need, we need to contract the supply. We need to make DAI more scarce and we need to make it more uh, appealing for people to hold DAI. So what the governance process then does is it comes to consensus around, okay, we need to, um, you know, we need to make it more appealing to hold DAI. That means the DAI savings rate needs to go up and we need to make it less appealing to generate DAI because we want to contract the supply. So we also need to set to increase what's called a stability fee, which is the cost of, um, borrowing DAI with your own collateral or generating DAI through the protocol. And um, this way, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a balancing act where um, you, these rates keep changing as long as DAI is not trading close to one, to one US dollar. And then as they change, they push it in the direction of one US dollar. And this is how um, DAI has managed to stay stable and uh, peg to the US dollar for more than two years at this point. What gave you this idea to, to incorporate supply and demand into MakerDAO as a fundamental part of the overall system? Yeah, exactly. And it really is actually just basic microeconomics, but applied in a very novel way using blockchain technology. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, I think supply and demand is like such an instrumental part of our entire world. And I think it's largely misunderstood. So I'm curious, like, uh, do you have an economics background? Like, uh, sort of what's your background leading into the idea of MakerDAO? Yeah, so interestingly, my background is actually both um, business and economics, but also biochemistry. And what I found when uh, I designed the Megadot protocol is that, yeah, on one hand, it is, you know, it's, we, we need to draw on these basic, um, you know, basic uh, concepts in, in microeconomics, like supply and demand, right? And, and the fact that if, um, you, know, you know, if you increase demand for a stable coin, that should drive the price up, right? And the, so you want to increase demand for the stable coin when the price is below $1, right? And similarly, if you um, decrease supply, so by making it more difficult to, to generate the, the coin or make it more expensive to borrow, similarly, that will push the price up. And you can also do the opposite, right? If the price of the stable coin is too high, you can actually decrease demand or you can increase supply. Um, and, and so that's like the very basic microeconomics logic, but then, you also need to do this in a, in sort of a larger picture, which is where it starts looking a little bit more like biochemistry, essentially, because you can you can really compare it to homeostasis, right? The the process of a cell constantly uh, using feedback loops, so using um, negative feedback loops, where uh, there is a you know like if the if the stablecoin deviates away from one US dollar, there needs to be a a response that then brings it back in line and then cuts off the response, right? So it, it goes back to one US dollar and then there's no more change in the, in the rates in the system. Um, and in the end, a lot of people think when they first look at the mega protocol that it's extremely complicated, right? And there are so many moving parts. But once you actually get to fully wrap your head around it, it actually is a very elegant uh, mechanism that has been simplified, simplified as much as it possibly can yet still remains sound in that these, you know, ba the basic appliance of, of um, supply and demand um, and, and um, the basic mechanics of how it's controlled and the incentives of the people running the governance, which are the MKR holders, all of that basically comes together to create a system that is able to, on one hand, be fully decentralized and fully transparent without a, a central authority having some sort of special access to the system. 
but at the same time providing the stability that people are used to from the regular banking system and the regular financial system. Do you expect this new push into Asia to uh, have an effect or what do you think the dynamics will look like on the system with this new push into Asia? Perhaps it won't be so notable because you already have a presence there, but I'm curious, have you thought this through at all? Yeah, I would certainly expect that, um, especially when you look at something like the, our integration of DAI and the DAI savings rate on uh, the OKX platform, that that should really drive a lot more users on the DAI demand side. So a lot more stablecoin users into the protocol, which could then mean that because, um, you know, because there's more demand for the stablecoin coming from the, from the market, um, the response by the governance of the protocol might be to reduce the rates in the system and also make it cheaper to generate DAI so that this new demand can be met um, with, with new DAI and make sure that the, the price stays stable around $1. Um, and I think in the past, typically what we've seen is mostly that it's been DAI supply coming out of Asia. So it's been more sophisticated users that have been um, using the the most popular Ethereum wallets in China and, and um, across Asia to, to, to generate DAI in order to um, get leverage exposure to Ethereum. So like more, you know, in, in the past, it's been more advanced users doing more risky operations focused on leverage. And now we're seeing this even greater group of people that will come into the system and start using the protocol um, not for this like very advanced use case of, of uh, accessing leverage, but rather just as a, as a stability hedge, maybe against their own, you know, maybe if they think that their own currency has too much inflation, or maybe because they think having these low risk, but still uh, decent yields that, um, that the DAI savings rate and DeFi offers, that this can be a very appealing financial product to have access to in addition to what they have access to locally. Are you planning a like a stable coin based on the renminbi or uh, any other Asian currencies? Yeah, so the Mega protocol is designed to ultimately be completely um, controlled by a decentralized governance process, right? So be controlled by the MPA holders and actually separate from from uh, the Mega Foundation um, and and the the original development team. And one of the things that's really important as we decentralize the governance of the protocol and as we ensure that the community is able to run it completely on its own is that uh, the community also has the ability to grow the system as as they want to grow it so that would also include adding new stable coins beyond just the us dollar and i would expect that the first one that will come is going to be the euro um, and then the other major world currency so that would include the renminbi and some other major Asian currencies. And actually the goal is in the long run, every single currency will be available in a stablecoin format within the, the mega protocol and potentially even assets beyond stablecoins. So other types of synthetic assets like stocks or commodities. And as always, the whole point is just, we want to make all of these things available to everyone instead of just the few people, relatively speaking, that today have this uh, very great access to the global financial system while billions of others are actually com left completely on the fringes. So I understand that you have a presence in Asia, like Shanghai, for instance. Could you tell me about some of the groundwork that you've done there? Yeah, so actually, um, uh, our China community lead, Pen Chao, um, is actually one of the oldest employees of the Mega Foundation. And uh, he's been really active in the crypto community in China and is, is uh, somewhat famous in, the, in China, actually. They call him Teacher Chow because he always talks about economics and, and you know, the mega protocol and DeFi. And uh, I think so far what we've achieved really well in, uh, in China, especially, is that we, we have a lot of, of uh, connections to the very um, you know, advanced users and very technically savvy um, crypto community there. Um, and we also have a lot of presence at like events for developers and, and um, you know, the people that are really into crypto and the, you know, the crypto industry itself, the people who work with crypto on a daily basis and so on. And so 
what we want to do now is we want to use this as a base to start sending our, you know, describing a project and sending a message to the more regular users of crypto in China and broader Asia. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm kind of curious about maybe some of the other updates that have uh, been announced lately at MakerDAO, like uh, multi-collateral uh, DAI, for instance. Um, I'm kind of curious what the thinking is behind that, the process as well. And uh, are there any uh, plans to, of incorporating Bitcoin at all? Or will this only be uh, uh, new tokens uh, implemented once they're approved yeah, so, by the risk team, of course? Yeah, so um, multi-collateral DAI is really... In many ways, you can call it the full realization of the Maker Protocol. So, multilateral DAI is actually the version of the system that we have been working on for the past five years. And what was in place before multilateral DAI, um, which is called single collateral DAI, was really more of an initial version that we we decided to create so that we could already start testing out um, what a decentralized stablecoin would look like in practice and we could allow the ecosystem around the stable countries to begin forming. But now with the launch of multi-level DAI, we actually have the full system live. And that means we can start accessing the, you know, the full range of features that decentralized finance uh, makes possible. And one of the things that includes is, is the fact that you can use multiple collateral types, which really is the, the biggest feature and, and the reason for the name. Um, but there's actually also, other features, including the die savings rate, which is a, a really big step as well, because this is the first time there is a low risk um, savings return available in crypto on a on a USD denominated stablecoin. Um, and and in many ways, the die savings rate is actually what's more exciting in the short run, because the the multi collateral feature, um, while it is the most important, it will take a couple of months and even years to fully roll it out and fully see its its potential. But where it is going is it's quite amazing. So basically um, the system has the capability to support any number of collateral types in the long run. So initially uh, t like today it actually only supports two collateral types. So it supports Ethereum and then uh, an, an Ethereum based token called basic attention token. But once um, once this upgrade process has has come a little bit further and there's you know the community and the ecosystem is uh, ready to basically take the next step then what's going to be, start happening is a lot more new assets are going to be onboarded and that will include all the different ethereum based tokens that will include cross-chain assets like bitcoin certainly um, in fact there already exists multiple versions of of um, cross-chain bitcoin assets on ethereum today um, but I think what's most exciting is that it will also start to include Ethereum-based tokenized real-world assets that will be brought onto the Ethereum blockchain and then used as collateral in the Mega Protocol. And this means that it will be possible to use things like gold, the tokenized gold in, let's say, a vault in Singapore, for instance, or you know, real estate in America that is then where the deed is tokenized and that token is then used as collateral in order to get a, a low rain, a low rate um, loan from a decentralized protocol. Or it can even do things like trade finance. So small businesses accessing the blockchain in order to get a direct line of credit that's based on their invoices, which are then tokenized. Um, and all of these things are actually coming along already. So the Mega Foundation is focusing a lot on, on um, you know, researching and uh, experimenting with and testing and like running like actual trials in practice around how you, how you deal with things like compliance and the regulation around this stuff and reconcile the fact that we're trying to bring, you know, real world regulated assets into a ultimately um, you know, authority-less decentralized protocol and how do you reconcile those two things? Um, but it is possible and we've done a lot of very successful uh, trials with different companies from all around the world that have been tokenizing various um, assets and then done these like uh, test runs essentially where we, we simulated what it would look like to use those assets as collateral in Maker and then 
you know, calculated how much money they would save in terms of the interest rates they have to pay to banks, or maybe in some cases they are not even able to get a line of credit from the current banking system because their their asset just doesn't fit into the current models. Um, and the like today, I mean, we can we can say that pretty much all the financial assets as we know them today and the, and the financial markets as we know them will likely get tokenized over time because of the inherent efficiency of the blockchain. But when you, you know, that's just the beginning. And when you go beyond that, there's going to be an even, you know, more uh, like a, a new wave of innovation that's difficult to even predict, but that certainly is going to really like turn the financial system on its head and inject this, you know, the, the, the value and the, um, the advantages of blockchain technology into the financial system as it exists today. Bitcoin was really the first uh, cryptocurrency that made an a impact on the, on the planet, I think, uh, and sort of even changed the dialogue around the nature of money. And then there was discussion around blockchain. And now we're moving into this period of uh, decentralized finance and DeFi and discussion of like really a whole alternative system of finance built, if not on decentralized platforms, at least uh, built on in challenger platforms. You mentioned uh, gold and tokenizing gold. I'm curious, as we move further into this, uh, as DeFi uh, matures, like what role will gold have in the financial system in your opinion, if any? Well, I think that gold is very similar to Bitcoin. So I think that gold will play a role as a very uh, essential and reliable form of collateral that everyone places a value on. Um, so I, I think that exactly what where where tokenized gold really makes a lot of sense is if you if you use it as collateral to generate dye, for instance. Um, and I mean, it's actually like. There even now today is this trend of central banks, for instance, preferring to to buy up gold because it's just this universal store of wealth. And Bitcoin, in some ways, it competes with gold, but I think in other ways, it also just complements it. And and ultimately, from the perspective of the mega protocol, it's just really nice to have Bitcoin, which is this great store of wealth and and very interesting um, type of of collateral asset, and then also gold, which is similar in some ways different in other ways and ultimately those two together just means you have even more diversification and just better risk management yeah i think with the advent of the internet we really saw like a deep platforming if you will of a lot of the main uh, media companies you used to have to buy ad space from like a handful of companies and it would cost a ton of money and then we kind of transitioned to where we're able to connect directly with our audiences through like the Twitters, the Facebooks and other social media platforms, regardless of what you think of them, it's probably a, a step in the right direction compared to just a handful of uh, companies controlling the communications of the planet through television, et cetera. And now I think, you know, we might be seeing uh, kind of the same thing happening in finance and in money where uh, we will be able to hold our wealth outside of the banking system, whether that be through precious metals, um, physical precious metals, or uh, tokenized versions thereof, which is quite exciting. So I'm curious, uh, I think it's a, not more than exciting, I think it's like transformational, but I'm curious, like what's your future vision of DeFi? Like what, and what's the timeline? Where do you see like decentralized finance heading? And how long do you think that'll take? Yeah. I think it's very difficult to predict how long it will take for, for DeFi and blockchain to truly impact the world. Um, and people typically tend right, to overestimate the short-term transformation and how quickly that will happen, but then completely miss the, just the fundamental transformations that will happen in the longer term. Um, but what, like, the way I like to say it is actually that um, in some ways, I don't think that it's really that DeFi will replace the current financial system or like that DeFi will take over the current financial system. I actually think that to some extent what will also happen is that the financial system and the banks and the institutions and the governments even will actually take over DeFi and actually embrace it and use it to improve their own efficiency, their transparency, their compliance, all of these, all of these 
positive things that they all you know focus on and work very hard to improve um and you know there's obviously also going to be a lot of disruption uh, and creative destruction and i think it's really going to be all based around this dynamic of at some point the the existing system will realize that whoever moves first and whoever actually um, learns to how to harness this technology and how to use it to provide better services as you know the better versions of their current services um, they will really get a massive advantage in the market and it also just you know it also just plays into to the trend of um, financial globalization right um, block, the blockchain just only makes this even easier and allows for things like leapfrogging in the in the areas where uh, the financial systems aren't so developed, but also things like connecting the you know connecting the unbanked with the global capital markets and all of these things is just going to unlock so much and such tremendous wealth that I don't think that the uh, the incumbent financial players or at least not all of them will miss this opportunity. Right? I think a lot of them will will jump on the bandwagon and, and to some extent actually be the ones leading it forward. Rune, we, this, we started this discussion talking about MakerDAO's move into Asia with 27.5 million from uh, your partners Dragonfly and Paradigm. Do you have a history in uh, Asia or in China? And if so, like why does it excite you to be able to kind of take this next step into those markets? Yes, yeah, so I actually, I actually moved to China when I was 18 and later I had a, a small business there for a couple of years uh, and I also speak Chinese and uh, my wife's even Chinese. So uh, I, I, I actually have a very close personal relationship with, with China specifically. And um, I think that also, you know, I've even done business there before with a, with a different, you know, in a different industry. And I think what really excites me about this move into Asia now as we're doing is that you know, one of the main things I learned from my time in China is that it can be very, very difficult to to actually, um, you know, enter China and, and do sustainable business there as an outsider. You really do need those insider connections. You really do need that, like, local understanding and that, that um, um, just like the, you know, that inside view um, and also the the you know, the, the recognition, uh, local recognition, right. And, and the, the familiarity, because in fact, that's, that is really how, you know, all markets typically work and especially emerging markets. But I think China is, is very unique in the sense that it makes such a massive difference. If you can have a, you know, a famous name like dragonfly actually back you. And it, it means that when I've been to China with, with them, right. And as I've, you know, as I've, um, interacted with with the network that they've made available to us there i really get you know this this um this unique insider access that uh, i've you know I've, I've in the past i've sort of known that existed right and every uh, you know me and everyone else trying to do business in china have been scratching their heads trying to figure out how do you break through like how do you how do you get access um and so that's why i'm really excited about this right because now i actually feel like we have this unique opportunity to actually, um, you know, approach China from the inside. We've spoken today with Rune Christensen, the founder of MakerDAO. Thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.